Hello everybody, my name is Max Markwald and I'm here to talk to you today about my exhibition titled Skin which is on view at the McDonough Museum of Art from now until April 2nd. This exhibition caught me at a bit of an unexpected crossroads in my career. I had three painting shows all get rescheduled for around the same time. So I had three different gallery uh, galleries asking me pretty much the same question, which was, did I want to be marketed and labeled as a queer artist, an LGBTQ plus artist, a transgender artist, or no label at all? I didn't know how to answer that. <laughs> There's no right or wrong answer. It's just a personal preference, but I didn't know how to answer it. I felt caught between two extremes. If I took on a label, my work became one-dimensional. People would see that and assume they knew everything they needed to know about me and my artwork. But not taking it on felt like a missed opportunity. But I couldn't describe what that missed opportunity was. Or at least I couldn't until I wrote my statement, which I opened by saying, Avoiding the label, queer artist, for 27 years afforded me plenty of time to figure who I was before coming out. But that's not why I ran from the label for so long. Maybe it's because queer still has that bitter taste of a word I was taught not to say. Maybe it's because queer feels like a declaration of arrival, a one-way ticket destination. Or maybe my hesitation came from an unconscious internalization of transphobia, the permeating cultural question that I hear too often whispered as if begging to be left unanswered. Why do they have to throw it in my face? Big thanks to all my friends who proofread my statement for me. I thought it was funny that all my queer friends who proofread it for me picked out the same line as resonating with them, and it was this Maybe it's because queer still has that bitter taste of a word I was taught not to say. Another way I played with writing this out was, I never wanted to grow up to be a bad word. And then there's this question, why do they have to throw it in my face? I heard it growing up, I hear it now, I've heard it too much. And it's always whispered. When I was younger and it was whispered, the fact that it was whispered reinforced this idea that queer is bad, impolite, and should be kept behind closed doors. But now that I'm older, I see it a little bit differently. I see it like if you're going to whisper this behind my back, I'm going to shout it for everyone to hear. Well, the first problem that comes up when you do that is getting hate disguised as a critique. I love any and all feedback about my work when it comes from a supportive position. But what I have encountered that I'm not okay with is when people come to my work having already decided that they are strongly against gay marriage and strongly against uh, trans rights, and rather than having that conversation, they try to hide that hate behind formal technical jargon. I address this in my statement by saying, Taking on the label, queer artist, invites the critique that my paintings should be independent of my transgender identity. This criticism proposes that artwork should not rely on random assignments of uniqueness. But this is just an eloquent way of saying, If your work was good enough, it would not be queer. The politically correct version argues that, in a perfect world, your gender identity should not matter. But this, too, is just a polite way of saying, queer does not matter, and therefore should not be seen. When I posted a studio picture with the caption, painting myself once a month for a year as a way of documenting my gender transition, 
I received the comment, vanity, identity, cringe, and I couldn't help but smirk. I couldn't help but smirk because it meant that I was no longer a silent participant in the attitude that queer deserves to be unspoken. (sighs) Vanity, identity, cringe. I love it so much. I love it so much because I could have never come up with a more succinct poetic takedown of my own work. And it brings me back to what I was saying earlier about this, when you whisper, I shout. If you're going to hide behind the anonymity of the internet. I'm going to take those words and say it with my full voice as a way to get to be the one to decide what it means. My painting professor, uh, Mark Soplin, taught me that if people aren't spitting on your artwork, then it's meaningless and bad. That's pretty great, right? (laughs) I understood what he meant, but I didn't get it. He was saying, the highest compliment you can get is that someone is so challenged by your paintings that they want to destroy them. I understood what he meant, but I didn't get it, because at the time he taught me that, I thought, in order for my work to do that, I would have to really actively be going out in the world and looking for a fight. But now that I'm here and my work is challenging, I see it a bit differently. I see it like, I didn't pick this fight. I'm just taking it up. See, because I tried to do it the polite way. Tried to keep it out of whisper. Tried to follow the rules. And I still had people offended that I painted men in makeup and women flexing their muscles, which are two things no one should be offended about. So I didn't pick this fight. I'm just taking it up. I never wanted to write an artist statement that was a list of complaints. I've been very fortunate in my life, very lucky, especially these past couple years with my painting. I've been very lucky. And I uh, just have nothing but good words to say about the Akron art community, and thank you so much to everybody in that community for supporting me. But I was getting this comment about my work a lot recently, came in different ways, and, and it boiled down to people telling me, it must be nice being a queer artist because that's trendy right now. And I had someone else tell me it must be easier being a trans painter because now I don't have to come up with ideas for my work. Uh, Yeah, that, that cuts a little deep. So I thought if my work is sending the message to non queer people that it's all parties and parades on this side of the rainbow, then maybe I ought to say something. And I do so in my statement. Taking on the label, queer artist, carries the pressure of representing an entire community. But I can only speak to my personal experiences. And for me, gender too often feels like heaviness. I have been denied health care, denied health insurance, harassed in public, and have had my job threatened for being queer. In a mandatory high school class, I was taught the nuances of how acting on homosexuality is a sin. When gay marriage was illegal, Summit County Probate Court commissioned me for a painting which is displayed above the desk where couples sign their marriage license. As an out trans man, I donated artwork to Valor Home, a homeless veteran shelter, at a time when there was and still is a ban on transgender people serving in our military. And so for me, there is this heaviness because civic participation has been paired with exclusion. When I made that painting for Summit County Probate Court, it was a proud moment in my early career. I was still trying to figure out what being a painter was going to look like. It wasn't traumatic. I didn't lose sleep over it. But there was uh, this background static, this this background fact that here I was uh, making work to better the community's experience of marriage, which was something I legally could not participate in. 
And then when gay marriage got legalized, I foolishly thought something like that would never happen again in my painting career. Uh, and then, you know, here comes this ban on transgender people serving in our military. I end my statement by saying, I take on the label, queer artist, not as a stopping point, but rather as a way of looking at a system that does not recognize my existence and saying, you don't get to tell me what that word means anymore. I never thought painting would bring me to a place where I had to use my full voice. And now here I am, and I have to wonder, how did I get here? Well, in thinking about that, the first thing I realized was I've been avoiding labels long before this queer thing came along. So <laughs> that's the first thing. <laughs> Anytime I get my work boiled down to my paintings are blank, and they talk about blank, I always take that away and try to say the same thing with different language. So one of the first conceptual projects I, I worked on was painting anonymous people to look like iconic figures. So I was looking at the history of portrait painting as a history of people getting to decide who's important in society, and I wanted to subvert that and say, it's the everyday common people who are living life with no grand expectations who are most important in our society. So I get that work boiled down to one word, anonymous. So I said, well, what happens if I take that away? Can I say the same thing? And I did by painting uh, my friends and family as iconic figures. The first body of work I made after graduating Meyer School of Art was a series of androgynous self-portraits. These paintings are funny to me now because I can see how in this body of work I was dealing with realizing I was trans without having the language for it. I vaguely knew what the T in LGBTQ stood for, but I didn't get it yet. And I didn't know it was an option yet. And I get that work boiled down to self-portraiture, exploring gender. I said, well, what happens if I take away self-portraiture? So I did that, and I painted my friends dressed as uh, Rosie the Riveter as a way of subverting gender. Coming out of that body of work, I think, okay, maybe... Okay, okay, I got it now. Maybe I'm a portrait artist. Maybe that's the thread of my work. So I gotta go take that away. <laughs> and I painted masculinity without showing the face. So I painted my hairy legs in the bathtub. I painted these ridiculous little paintings of Axe Body Spray and, and uh, um, other overly gendered products like deodorant. I painted an old photo of myself at 14 where I looked super tomboyish, but I obscured the face. And so here again, I was able to make work about the same thing uh, without it being uh, what my work was branded as. So I took away portraiture and was still able to talk about gender. This entire series I titled Unnamed. So why did I do that? Well, in March of 2018, I filed the paperwork to legally change my name and gender. But my court date wasn't set until September 6th. And I can remember it being September 6th because it's two days after my 25th birthday, so easy to remember there. But that was a pretty big five-month gap there. And I named all the paintings I made in that time period unnamed. Coming out of that body of work is when I did successfully legally change my name and come out professionally. And I painted myself once a month for a year as a way of documenting my gender transition. So first thing I'm going to say about this uh, body of work is that it was at the transition gallery of the Summit Art Space. 
And so by being at the transition gallery, it eliminated any easy, obvious title I could have given this body of work because my name was already different. I didn't want to confuse people anymore. <laughs> so I landed on dissociation. At the time, I didn't realize how much of a harsh, ugly word people would perceive that as. But I'm happy I named it that. And I named it that because there's a disconnect between how I experience myself and how the outside world expects me to experience myself. For me, being trans is a process of alignment. It's a unification. It's a coming together. But the outside perspective is that it's a fracturing, a dying off, a switching over. And so it was the disconnect between how I see myself versus how the world sees me is why I named the body of work dissociation. The format of the project sets up the expectation that I was going to show a fluid progression of gender. That by looking at the work, you'd be able to know which was the first painting and which was the last painting. And that you would be able to come to the body of work and point on a spectrum of, of gender which painting you felt was the magic moment where I switched over. See, But that's the outside perspective. For me, I'm not becoming anything. I already am a man, and so I wanted to look like that in all the paintings. And if that meant turning around, if that meant covering my face, then that's what I did. At the opening, I heard so many amazing conversations uh, from people who understood that that expectation was being broken and then were looking back into the work for new answers. I heard a lot of people ask questions like, you know, what does the trans experience mean in a painting like September versus a painting like April? And what does it mean uh, when I have hands in, in the work? Or what does it mean when I'm tying it to outside events? And at the opening, I knew the body of work was saying what I wanted it to say when each piece was brought to me separately as being someone's favorite, and each piece was brought to me separately as almost not fitting in with the rest, as almost needing to be uh, taken out. <laughs> it would have been a lot easier to paint a fluid progression of gender. I, in essence, would have only had to make one painting 12 times and eliminate variables, which is something I sort of have the technical facility to do. I instead, what I had to do was make 12 paintings that each have their own story, each have the uh, potential of being uh, pulled out as an outlier, the potential of breaking someone's expectation while still having a certain level of cohesion. I started with September because that's the month I legally changed my name. And I actually, I painted this uh, in two weeks, which is uh, faster than I usually paint. But I was part of a group exhibition at the Emily Davis Gallery that I wanted this painting to be a part of. And so I'm sitting in my studio, having just finished it, uh, getting ready to be that artist that drops off a wet oil painting in the rain. <laughs> and I have to decide if I'm going to name it September and because at this point no one knew what my project was I was still testing the waters I could still bail out and I was asking myself should I keep going should I continue this project and I had to ask myself how does this document my trans experience my face isn't even in it you know, am I even in this painting and the next question I asked myself was, why do I have to show my face to someone else's standard of masculinity for me to be a man? And this question asking became a pattern in my work that, uh, in a way, is what got the project done, <laughs> is what drove me to keep going, you know, next painting to next painting. So October, I had to ask myself, you know, how does this document 
my gender transition. So my justifica- justification became, you know, why does my trans experience have to be forward facing? November, I'm not even in November. <laughs> not even in it at all. Why can't my trans experience be tied to the outside world? December. Everyone wants every painting to look like December. It's got this emotional quality. That was the number one comment I received about this body of work was people expected to see more emotional struggle. So I have to ask. Why does my trans experience have to be anguish all the time? Why can't I just have moments of emotional struggle? It also brings me back to what I was saying earlier. I didn't pick this fight. I'm just taking it up. The struggle with being trans isn't initiated by me. It comes from living under a government that doesn't recognize me. It comes from living in a community that hates me. It comes from the fact that queer still has that bitter taste of a word I was taught not to say. It's not my fault. Everyone was taught to keep it at a whisper. I didn't pick this fight. I'm just taking it up. I didn't initiate this struggle. I'm just picking it up. January. I like January because it's such an immature gesture. And, um, you know, put your hood up and pull the strings down. It's such a childish act. And so I have to ask, why can't my trans experience have moments of immaturity? February. I get a couple different interpretations of February. Some people tell me, It's this moment of perfect androgyny, of of being both genders at once. And other people look at it like it's boring and static. For me, in my head, I, I was thinking of February like, I am showing you everything you expect this project to be on the surface, but I'm still not actually showing you a fluid progression of gender. See, I'm showing my face. I'm showing delicate description of flesh and anatomy that then translates into gender. But I'm still not showing you what you expect out of this project. In the artist statement I displayed with this body of work, I say that these paintings are hiding in full view. And for me, February is the epitome of that line. March. March can be picked out as an outlier because it's the only one I'm not wearing any clothing, so I I have to ask. Why can't my trans experience have moments of nakedness? April. Everyone wants every painting to look like April. It's got all this confidence. It's got this painterly brushstroke. Why do I have to be confident all the time? May. What happened in May? (laughs) I love when people ask me this because it shows that, you know, they've had their expectation broken and are going back into the work and looking for new answers. Well, what happened in May was, at the time I was taking this reference photo, I had recently attended a funeral. And so I was thinking a lot about death and dying and decided to make this painting backwards from how I usually work. So usually, I start with a dark surface and I layer on all the lights and I don't use any black paint for May I started with a white surface I did a charcoal drawing spray fixed it then I did all these gooey gummy grubby layers of of thin oil paint on top of it till it was so dark you couldn't see nothing no more and then I took sandpaper and I brought back the drawing so I didn't use any black paint or, sorry, <laughs> I didn't use any white paint. It was the opposite of what, how I usually work. I didn't use any white paint. So, March, April, May, June. Oh, I got, <laughs> got lost in the year there. June, baseball. This painting, I guess, means something a little different now because 
as I'm pre-recording this, the Cleveland baseball team has decided to change their name, but don't know what it's going to be yet. I was coming to this painting thinking about, you know, baseball as this great American pastime and thinking about how does my trans experience fit into a culture that's nostalgic for some weird twisted notion of America the Great, right? When if you look deeper into that, all that is is being nostalgic for times in our history when I wouldn't have been able to be out in any capacity. This weird nostalgia for times in our lives where people had less rights. So how do I fit into that narrative? June, July. July is my favorite. No, I don't want to say that. I like April too and September, but July, I'll say July is my favorite way of working. And if I was going to show a fluid progression of gender, they probably all would have had the style of July. And this is painting is a, is a good example of uh, where I came into the piece with a certain idea, and then the painting took control of itself and decided to be what it was going to be on its own, and I had to sort of give up control and let it do that. So May was super low-key value scale, super dark, and I thought it would be... Uh, fun to then do one that was high, high, high key value scale, super washed out. Well, <laughs> obviously it didn't turn out that way, but that's how it started. So June, July, August, that's the last one. So I'd say it was probably not until about January that I publicly made known what my project was while I was working on it. I wanted to give myself time to bail out. <laughs> it was a, you know, intense project. I wasn't sure if I was uh, going to be able to keep it up for a whole year, and uh, I'm happy I did, but once people knew what the project was, I, uh, people would say, oh, so the last one, you're going to be like smiling, and your hands are going to be up, and it's going to be this great moment. And I had to ask myself, why do I have to wait till the end of my project to have a moment of triumph? Why do I have to wait for some external certification of switching over to have a moment of joy? I have this other pattern in my work where I'll do a really intense self-portraiture project looking inward and then I'll look outward and try to paint things I'm passionate about without having to be the subject which is what I did in the Rosie series, and it's what I did with my drag portrait series, which was on view at Akron Soul Train Gallery. With that body of work, I was painting drag performers who use that medium for charity and political activism. So not all drag does that. I was specifically focused, uh, narrow focused on that. So for example, I painted Sister Sour Queen, who belongs to the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence, a nationwide charity uh, organization of drag nuns. This organization as a whole raises money for LGBTQ plus causes, as well as working to combat religious-based hate speech. My friend, Sister Sour Queen, uh, worked on a project for uh, Kentucky Pride, Louisville Pride, where... They helped make a huge banner that they invited parade goers to come and write in Sharpie positive messages they felt about themselves. And then they took this banner and they wheeled it in front of the section of far-right extremists protesting gay rights. So if you've ever been to Pride, <laughs> you know what that's like. It, uh, it, it isn't all a parade. There is uh, people you know, um, on the perimeter throwing stuff, yelling stuff, uh, uh, telling you to go to hell. So another thing that the sisters will do is play super loud music to drown out that hate. And uh, when there's people who are sort of with megaphones reading out of context Bible passages, the sisters will stand there and read the Bible back to them. And I just love that image of using one person using the Bible for hate and a group of people celebrating gender using the Bible to drown out that hate. I also painted Rhett Corvette, who's a Cleveland-based drag king who uses uh, their um, art to promote 
family-friendly queer voices, which is uh, a very, I think, uh, something I'm very passionate about, especially uh, because, you know, I grew up in a culture that felt like, uh, you know, you had to protect kids from knowing what anything queer was, when really that's just a whole section of our population. Uh, kids should know that queer is an option. I also painted uh, Ryder Slowly and Macho Grande, who are two members of the Cleveland Kings Action Pack, who is a organization of drag kings that raise money for uh, charities such as Colors Plus Youth Center, Northeast Ohio Black Health Coalition, Magnolia Clubhouse. Um, those are just, uh, to, just to name a few of the ones I've been to and know about. And so for me coming to painting drag performers, I was coming from the viewpoint of a spectator. I have been drawn to the high energy fun bravado of drag the celebration of gender. Because performance is an ephemeral medium, I wanted to use painting to make permanent these radical acts. Currently in my studio, I'm working on a three foot by about 18 foot painting of my chest post-top surgery. I'm pre-recording this, so if you're hearing this, it should be done and on the wall, fingers crossed, right? But uh, I'm also going to pause here and say, so I'm, I'm painting my chest post-top surgery, and I'm choosing to be open about that. But it is inappropriate to ask anybody what is underneath their clothing, so please don't do that. And please don't assume that because I'm being open about this, that the queer person in your life is as open about this topic as I am. Surgery is a very personal, private topic, um, so please be mindful of that. But I am doing, uh, making this painting for the specific purpose of normalizing trans bodies. And I was thinking about this painting, and I realized, you know, maybe, I'm a conceptual artist, right? So maybe it's like, okay, okay, I got it now. The thread of my work is I'm a conceptual artist. Because the concept is more important than the labor itself. So if I take my reference photos, I take my artist statement, my measurements, and I email it to my friend, have them paint it and send it back to me, does it say the same thing? Well, I believe the answer is yes, because it would still normalize trans bodies, still take this harsh, ugly word, surgery, and turn it into something beautiful, and still be a platform to talk about queer issues, even if I'm not the one who paints it. Yeah, there's a different emotional quality, a different stylistic quality, but it still says the same thing if I'm not the one who paints it. Therefore, uh, I'm a conceptual artist. Well, now I gotta go and mess that up. <laughs> gotta go take that label away uh, because there's this painting in my studio that's been nagging at me. Nagging at me, nagging at me. And So at the end of every studio day, I, I try to use up the leftover paint on my palette for non-goal-oriented paintings. It, and that usually manifests in these tiny little paintings that clutter up my studio space and never get done. Um, but it's still a good way to decompress at the end of the day. Well, this year I decided I'm going to do that same concept, but just have them be these larger uh, paintings. And then I only have one thing to lug around my studio. Well, I, I, I went around, I got around to finishing one of them, and that's the painting that's been nagging at me. And it's been nagging at me because I'm the only one who could have painted it. I'm the only one who could have painted it because I'm the only person who, at 10 years old, was standing in the kitchen making the memory that became the reference for that painting. And I love writing, but no amount of writing could accurately describe what it looks like and what it felt like to be standing there in that moment. So it has to be painting, and it has to be me who paints it, versus concept being more important than the labor. I don't think one way of working is better or worse than the other, but now that I'm aware that there's these two operating systems in my studio, I'm excited about putting them together and, and pulling them apart even farther. Well, thank you so much for listening. This has been a little bit about uh, where I've been, where I'm at, where I'm going. Please leave your questions in the comments below. And I'm going to go ahead and take a minute to answer some of the uh, more frequently asked questions I get. 
So, first, first one I get is, how long does it take you to make a painting? Well, that's a tough question. I would say, since I, uh, since the past five years, I make anywhere between 12 and 20 paintings a year. And it's a tough question because it really depends on the method I'm using. So take a painting like July. July is a bit of an outlier painting because it only took three days, and that's the quickest I've ever made a painting and pr probably will always be the qu quickest I've ever made a painting that large. And that painting was so quick because every part of the surface has only been touched one time. Like, I managed to get it all right the first time and didn't have to go back in and fix anything. So that's why that painting was so fast. Uh, but then I have other paintings like um, uh, Rachel as a vintage clown. And they that painting, because I was purposely doing a lot of thin layers and building up the surface, took about six months. And I wasn't working on it every day for six months. I was doing a thin layer, letting it dry, doing a layer, letting it dry. And it was... I would say actively in my studio for that amount of time. So it's also a bit of a tough question because I like to uh, kind of create an assembly line in my studio practice where I, so I bulk buy all of my paint in these big cans and I tube it up myself. And that, you know, up front takes a lot of time, but in the long run saves a lot of money and saves the daily task of getting your palette set up because I have every... All my colors are already mixed up. I just have to get them out of their fresh tubes. And I also will um, bulk buy wood and, and make stock stretcher bars so that anytime I need a painting, I, you know, that takes a lot quicker because <laughs> I've already done part of the work up front. I don't have to start from scratch every time. And so it, it's, uh, that's why I arrived back at this sort of unsatisfactory answer of uh, between 12 and 20 paintings a year is how fast I paint. I also get a lot of questions about, you know, where is this uh, ratio coming from, specifically with the dissociation series, and, and why do you work large scale? Well, starting with uh, the second part of that question... There's this preciousness that happens about working small where you, as a viewer, can feel ownership over it. It's like an object. You can pick it up. Uh, but when you paint something large scale, it has this community feel, this amplifying feel. And since a lot of my work is dealing with taking either anonymous or um, common day people or, or people who have been sort of kept out of uh, society and, and taking those people and turning them into iconic figures, it makes sense to amplify them as much as possible. And then this ratio. So this um, three feet by six feet, is a, I work a lot in that. And part of the reason why is because that fits in my hatchback. <laughs> but... It, but the ratio, I'm interested in the one by two ratio, like if whether that's, um, you know, 12 by 24 or four by eight, you know, it's just that ratio I like because it creates this very human size, right? And it's a chunk of personal space. I also get a lot of questions about my color palette. So I use two different color palettes. Mostly I just use a neutral one. And then for, uh, say, like my drag portrait series, I had to use uh, CMYK. But both of these color palettes I learned while I was at the New York Academy of Art. I was very fortunate to get a scholarship to attend the summer undergraduate residency program. So I was only there for a month, <laughs> just a month thing. and uh, But I learned so much. And one of the things I learned there was uh, these two color palettes. And... Primarily, I paint with yellow ochre, Venetian red, flake white, and ultramarine blue. Those are or ultra, or yeah, ultramarine blue, and those are all gambling colors. And then, it, then there's the CMYK color palette, which is just you know, taking uh, the, these computer colors and getting it in the oil paint. And those all have names that are very hard to pronounce, so I'm not going to repeat them. I can write them out for anybody who's curious what those are, but. Yeah, so those are um, my three most frequently asked questions. And yeah, thank you again so much for listening. Please leave your questions in the comments below. 
And thank you so much to uh, Claudia Berlinski and everybody at the McDonough Museum of Art and everybody at Youngstown State University. It has been such an honor to be a part of your Emerging Artist series. Thank you.